Sir Ramaphosa doesn't answer to anyone. I'm fascinated at this intersection between sport and politics. We would generally accept that during election period that we need to allow political parties to pay for those interviews. You pass through the eye of the eye of a needle. Spread the fire, welcome back to SMWX, and today we have a very special guest. I'm not special. <laughs> Mr. Nkuleko Nkeu, who had me on his show, Nkuleko and Culture. Make sure you check that out, it's a great YouTube channel. Nkuleko uh, has built the empire that is Itiski TV, yeah, the, God. the hugest uh, YouTube show on, on yeah, South God. African soccer. Now he's got another channel. You're basically a YouTube god. Uh, that's basically. <laughs> I'm not a YouTube uh, but Thank you very much, bro. No, no. Thank thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for that episode mm. as well. Yeah, uh, I think around fifty thousand people already, watched already. that. I was yeah. nervous because I didn't know whether or not we were gonna have an audience of ten thousand. Mm. My channel mm. has like forty-five thousand, if I'm not mistaken, or forty-four thousand yeah. subscribers. Yeah. So I was thinking, okay, maybe five thousand. Look at the flex already. Forty-five thousand. Some of us only have thirty thousand. I'm not flexing. <laughs> Only 40,000. When are you are sponsored by Mail and Guardian? <laughs> <laughs> can Idiski TV, though, like at least sponsor us? Um, we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Asina, we don't have money. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me, bro. No, no, the pleasure, the pleasure is mine. Um, our interview was interesting because. Behind the scenes, I learned a lot about how you built your YouTube channel. Sure. I think there are a lot of people out there who are interested in how YouTube works. They want to start creating content. Yeah. It feels like we're on the cusp of an explosion of YouTube channels in South Africa becoming almost a key source of media like TV yeah. or radio used to be. Tell us about the process of building a YouTube channel to the point where it becomes like this massive uh, asset. Yeah, I think the first one, it is TV, that I created with my friend Jason Aker. Mm. Um, we were in Cape Town and we were journalists mm. um, for Sokala Duma, which is the, the biggest newspaper publication. Yeah. So effectively our lives were to ask football players questions for a living. Mm. Um, and then we, they had a, they were moving forward with what they were doing. So more than just doing a newspaper every Wednesday, mm. um, they had a website which had a million users visiting every seven days. Mm. Um, and those million users every seven days needed to be served something different. And then what Jason innovated, which was not necessarily an innovation, it was something out there, but innovated for that company, mm. um, was something called Sokala Duma Radio. So he literally would have, he, he convinced them to spend 60 to 70,000 or 80,000 mm. to build um, some sort of studio within the office yeah. where there would be these two, three, four microphones. Sure. And I, a guy from Enyanga, would go and work for them. Mm. Um, we were still in Cape Town at the time to ask the players the questions, right? Mm. And then they would answer the questions. We would package that, put it on the website so that instead of only reading the articles about Benny McCarthy joining this club mm. or Sepiwa Shabalala uh, retiring from football, you could also hear a, an audio mm. product within mm. the website, whereas they also have a paper offering, a print offering. Sure. So they were looking at a 360 approach to producing content, and Jason innovated that within that space. Of course, mm. audio and podcast have already existed at the time, yeah, sure. and this is um, in 2017, but it was not something that they had thought of in that office. So basically, I started Itiski TV with Jason because we worked together in that framework. Within two years, we were making over 1.5 million rands. Wow. It was a team of two people, hmm. just like you and I sitting like this, like this. He would be the producer and the leader of it, and I would be the voice of it. And brands would partner into it because we had a lot of audiences mm. listening to my interviews with the soccer players. And then we could see, we could, oh, okay, we made this company money. Um, we come to Joburg to work for Massive Metro, mm. uh, an online radio station at the time. We had built a relationship with the owner, Tyron Willemser, and then the three of us, Tyron Willemser, Jason Aker, Ngulu myself, um, 
in my head, of course, I develop it is TV. It's my innovation, right? We go to this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take Junior Kanye's over and we're gonna watch football matches mm. and we're gonna upload them on YouTube. So that's like the first channel that I built. And then at some point after two How and a half subscribers years, subscribers now over 150k. Yes, over 100, 150,000 wow. subscribers. And then wow. we have a commitment from World Sports Betting, which is on the sleeve, right? Mm. Um, they sponsor us and we build them anywhere from 250,000 to 400,000 per month wow. just to be there based on the mm. numbers that we do per month. So you can actually buy SMWX if you want to. Because that's not my company alone. <laughs> <laughs> the pie is cut across four times. Uh, it, it, and then we have like over, because we have a newspaper now and we have a website. We have over 20, between 20 and 30 employees mm. uh, effectively. So it's not like 300,000 comes to me. Wow. I have a salary within that as well. And what, what was it like, like actually building it from the ground up and what kind of advice would you give people who, who want to build YouTube channels? Because I think there are a lot of people out there who are interested in, you know, creating their own content, but they don't know where to start or, yeah. or what to do. I always say that it was important for us to be journalists. So I'm an award-winning football mm. journalist. I have the voice. As you know, like mm. I'm full of nonsense. I'm out there. I try to create a personality for myself, mm. right? So I had to be that first. Sure. I had to be able to ask football players questions. They had to know me. They had to respect me, mm. right? Mm. Um, and then I, so that means even <laughs> none of these things are a coincidence. Even when I was working there, I still have this, the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet with over a thousand uh, contacts within football. Hmm. So I had, those are people that I had contacted in a period of two years hmm. because my job was to get as many interviews as I could. Maybe five times, five times a week, I would have to speak to different football personalities. So you have to have that. You. You could be lucky and be a 20-year-old um, and exist uh, or come from a vacuum of lack of experience, mm. uh, no industry contacts, um, no industry know-how, uh, no expertise. I was sort of like a football expert by the time I started ETSK TV, so that by the time I'm next to Tsovi Lagazi, who is the highest ever goal scorer in the history of Orlando Pirates in the mm. Premier Soccer League era, mm. um, that I can ask him questions and I could stand next to him shoulder to shoulder, competently and they could call me and they call me mister sometimes because they have so much respect sure. because of my understanding of football and the respect that I give to them as well. Mm. So it, it doesn't exist in isolation that you pick up a camera and you, you ask around people questions. You have to have some sort of foundation um, and I'm, I was lucky enough to have some sort of foundation within the media industry that I was already an award winning football um, journalist or football podcaster mm. three times nationally. So by the time we started ETSK TV we were already experienced. We've already um, worked in, in football, you know, so yeah, big, maybe big, back to the basics. Yeah. All you need to start a YouTube channel is a couple of cameras, a couple of microphones, um, and consistency. Yes, just shoot, make mm. it interesting, mm. shoot something that people are interested in hearing. I think it is key TV. In as much as I mean, you've seen the comments. Yeah. In as much as people go hard at us, they will still watch. Mm. They will still watch because they know it's valuable information. Um, football has had a framework of analyzing pre-match. So before the match they analyze the match on SABC1 or Supersport, yeah. right? And then the match plays, and then post-match they analyze the game. But it's it's kind of monotonous, and it's outdated, and the people are there for their jobs. Uh, they never mm. say... Because we... we because we're not company people, we are an independent digital space. Uh, we operate on the independent digital space, uh, an alternative market. We are able to say, oh, wow, we've just gone through two hours of a boring football game. It's unacceptable that some of these guys earn 300000 and they cannot shoot on target. Mm. And so we can say that. It's not hate. We can say that, and we can be passionate when we say that, because we know that that's what happened. Mm. But when you're watching SABC1, you would think that none of that happened. You know, and, and, and perhaps the reason why people quickly gravitated towards us is because they knew which they would get honesty, mm. they knew which they would get um, hard hitting views about the match, which is not hateful. And and, 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 and the most important thing as well is the language. Mm. Like Junior Kanye speaks what it speaks. Yeah. A mixture of Sutu and Zulu. Mm. I keep it English. Uh, it's over like as it keeps it Zulu. From time to time, I'll throw in Kosa there and Sutu there. Um, you know, Machaka speaks Sipedi mm. um, from time to time. So there's no, there's no limitation of the language. The black man between the ages of 18 and 45 or even 55 feels as though they can relate to this and that's why when I go around go to a mall, a security officer will, or security guard will come to me ask for a selfie and say they love the work because 
it's people who look like them mm. that they used to watch on the field of play mm. speak their own language and, and, and we were watching and they know that we were watching the same match that they were watching so we were going through the same experience we are not better than them mm. and we speak the same language so they identify with us so pretty much all of those factors come into play to make what it is TV is and, and, and what I like as well with my guys is that they're actually not technologically savvy so mm. they're not even on social media Junior Otso sure. Machaka even myself I'm, I don't care for social media mm. um, so even when things get rough and people are, are hitting us hard mm. they don't see the comments so we are able to come back tomorrow uh, and shoot another maybe video. I should try that you should try that <laughs> but you have a different audience though. Yeah, I'm interested also in the way that um, you have gone against this massive sports industrial complex in the form of like super sport and SABC and created an alternative yeah. path for sports and particularly soccer PSL expression. Uh, have you ever got any pushback from those bigger players? Um, are they, have they been worried about what you're doing? Have they tried to take over what you're doing and maybe make it a bit more mainstream rather than the kind of raw way in which you do it, which is just directly how people feel, how people speak and not having to feel like they need to put some TV voice on? Yeah, so there's been a significant push mm. from one of the shadows to get one of the guys. So wow. Junior, of course, is is we is um, is super popular. Um, whenever we shoot a video, at least fifty to a hundred thousand people are guaranteed to see it mm. uh, because of his style. It's always somewhere between twenty thousand and fifty thousand, which is a significantly yeah. decent number yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but with Junior, there's there's been in the last two years. This year has been better because we even had to have a meeting with it, uh, about it. Mm. He and I like face to face as men, and I mm. say to him, look, um, when the time comes when someone can be able to swoop in and take you. Mm. That will happen. And you will come to me and we will talk about it. I will be sad um, and mm. I will be sad to let you go. But of course, uh, if this is business. I understand it. Mm. I will move on to someone else. I don't want to lose them. I need to make that very clear. Mm. right? Because the reason why we had to have that uh, awkward meeting is because last year was 2021 and 2020. It, it, it had been a very um inconvenient period for us that every month mm. he would be stuck in a meeting with a TV channel which I'm not going to mention hmm. you know and I'm like okay why don't you take him then? Like in my head, I'm like, yo, do it then. Because yeah. for me, I don't like suspense. I was actually having this conversation with someone yesterday about the idea that if people were to kidnap me, um, I would rather them get rid of me instead of tormenting me for three days. Mm -hmm. Get rid. Of, if, if you're going to get rid of me on the third day, don't torment me for three days. Get rid of me on the first day <laughs> because I would rather you get it over and done with. You know, so we had that and had that throughout 2021, which I was in this meeting. Hmm. And in, in they, they gave him an ad, actually, in the build-up to the Soweto Derby hmm. um, on multi-choice television, hmm. which was great for him, and I was so happy for him. And then they gave him, I think they were, you could sense that they were testing their waters. Hmm. They gave him, he was a star of an ad. Uh, the ad um, theme was that he was seeing a psychologist, and the psychologist was asking him, how are you able to predict these matches? The Soweto Derby is coming up. Are you able to predict what's going to happen this weekend? That was like the, hmm. the heart and soul of the ad, the theme of the ad, you know, and then after that ad, maybe a month later, uh, they gave him a slot on a, a show called PSL Now, so I could be able to string these things together, and I'm talking to my brother, of course, um, Junior, and I could see, okay, there is a sustained uh, onslaught or push to have him on. <laughs> I think their biggest problem was that because Chiefs and Paris are such an important brand to them and their audience, the last thing they want to do is to piss off those clients by bringing them along. So coincidentally, um, it played to my advantage or to our advantage as a disc that we become the only platform that could give him the voice. And of course, it's well taken care of financially. I could argue that um, is perhaps the highest paid analyst in South Africa in football. Mm. Um, but it would need it would need other people to bring their pay slips. But I know for a fact that we've we've elevated him to that level. Mm. Right? Um, so that happened in terms of challenges. Um, and then we in, in January of this year we had the talk um, because there were so many other things as well, so many other issues that were happening behind the scenes. We had the talk and then one to one as a man I said, look, there is no way I'm gonna go through to twenty twenty two have uh, repeating what has just happened in twenty twenty one. 
I would, like I'm saying, the analogy, rather deal with me on day one and not torment me for three days. Mm -hmm. uh, I am more than happy um, to log out if I need to log out and uh, to be to be done harm accepting my fate on that first day as opposed to thinking about it for the next three or four days. Mm -hmm. You know, so we had those talks and we had an understanding actually and, 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 and respect came out of it because then I had to confront that situation and I said, look, I'm not going to tolerate this. I'm not going to be able to go through this again this year. You know, so that was one standout moment mm. um, from that and I've spoken about it and it, out of that came love and better appreciation for each other because he then realized what impact it had on me because actually it was preceded by, for the first time in our relationship, three weeks of not talking. Like I, don't, I didn't pick up a call. Mm. I actually didn't even record. Um, for three weeks what I did was send questions to Justice, who's our videographer. He's going to ask them questions. They will be on camera by themselves and ask and answer. And it took away from the viewing experience. Mm. And you could see that there was a decline in the numbers because we are two personalities we talk, I asked the, the the contract that is signed by our consumer is that they're gonna watch me asking them questions and they answer and then me redirecting them whenever they veer off. That's usually the nature of interviews, anyways, mm. right? But I decided that I'm not gonna be there. So for three weeks, no answering question, no answering of cell phones, mm. and it hurt him as well. Um, you know, so that's what happened in that period. But anyways, we're over that. That's why I'm able mm. to share it now. Mm. You know, it was preceded by that, and I made a statement. I'm not gonna be on camera. I'm telling you that this is not going to happen and in January of this year we had that conversation for an hour like like this mm. you know and I told him we can't have that so that was like the one major thing which was exacerbated by the channel um, I don't know because I didn't see the paperwork I don't know to what extent they went for him and what was the monies offered mm. um, all I can tell you is that we put him in a position where um, our main sponsor World Sports Betting he's their ambassador now and they're sponsoring his football club now so more than just spending on us as a channel they're spending on him mm. because Jason and I we, we, had, we made those talks possible and thanks to Jason for pushing it because because you could see that there were, that was our biggest risk at the time, you know. And the other thing is, I don't think it's a big deal, but there was a, and it actually helped us as well to, to, to have a quicker turnover for content. We used to go to the PSL's offices to record our matches, hmm. so to record our videos. We used to watch matches, go to the PSL offices. Is to that record. those balcony? Um, so it's, it's where I'm speaking and Junior is yeah. speaking. At the behind, you can see PSL, yeah, sure. the sign PSL in Park Town. Hmm. You know, so we didn't go inside; we we're just outside. Um, that's what ENCA would do when there's a story about the PSL. Hmm. That's what Newsroom Africa would do. But I, I could see how we are always there. Every every four days, we are always there. That's, that's that was our model. Hmm. We would go there. And shoot, um, you know, particularly during COVID. So I got a call from Fatuan Mfuni, who was the PSL spokesperson, communications manager. Um, and it was a cordial conversation mm. to say, look guys, you have a betting sponsor. It could be construed that the betting sponsor and you guys are associated with us, mm. the Premier Soccer League. Mm. Of course, they cannot control us talking about their product because it's up for public consumption. Yeah. But they told us to move from there, you know. So that's like, mm. that's not a big deal. You take it as a human being and you don't make, I think it's a first time I'm talking about it actually wow. okay. um, you don't make any noise about it mm. in fact it used to take us 30 to 45 minutes to drive there and mm. record there and go back and render the content and upload it so that it then we would upload the video two hours after the game mm. now usually the turnover is like 45 minutes after the game because yeah. like 10 minutes 10 minutes 10 minutes if it's three people so and then it renders for like 15 20 minutes so like 45 to an hour after a game so it helped us like so now we're like literally just watching and shooting and behind us is the screen that says it is TV. So can I ask as well, you know, having built this uh, massive platform, you've also now got Ngulu and Culture, which yeah. is a whole separate channel, which is doing really well. Thank building, you. I'm sure you're going to head to 50,000, 100,000 subscribers. Yeah. And there's a wider ecosystem building. There's Mac G, which and 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 that's the biggest. Yeah, uh, that's, that's that's the biggest amongst all of us. Yeah, he's in a different stratosphere, no, and no, we need to absolutely. identify that. Um, and sometimes they also speak about political questions, even though yeah. it's not necessarily directly. You've got the DJ Smoo, uh, Hustlers Corner. Corner. 
You've got your thing happening. Penwell has his the Penwell show. Oh, he's show. doing great. Shout out to him yeah. Yeah. for doing the Penwell show. I say to to him all the time that was a masterstroke because there had been questions about yeah. who and what he is and whether or not DJ Spoo um, was putting mm. him on, and I did, I didn't like mm. that. Mm. Dr. Sizwen Bofu Walsh is Dr. Sizwen Bofu Walsh, even if the first time you saw him was on ENCA mm. or the first time you saw him was on 702. Sure. That's a coincidence. Dr. Sizwen Bofu Walsh comes as a package with his own unique experiences, his own kind of expression, his own backwardness sometimes, own negative thoughts sometimes, but you are who you are. Mm. No one makes you. I had never made uh, Junior Kanye. Sure. So when Penwell mm. did the panel show with Rudebza, in the tribal media house, as I said to him, as a masterstroke, mm. I said, I want to be there as the third or the fourth interviewee. And I was mm. there. I and, saw that. And we did like 54,000 yeah. views. Yeah. And I was like, I said, I'm going to support you. I'm going to be there. Because I had been hearing noises yeah. about how DJ Spoo, and that's not, it, it didn't come from Spoo. DJ Spoo gave him a cosign. And I don't like that. I don't like when people construe things as though mm. this person made that person. I, I Like, from the bottom of my heart, I don't like that. I always deflect it when people say, mm. you saved Junior Kanye, because that man has to wake up in Davidton, decide to take a bath, mm. drive his own car to come to work. In exchange for his time and labor, we pay him. Yeah. No one makes anyone. It's such a simple exchange as that, that you come to work, we pay you, mm. you know, and we treat you decently. That's why you are able to come um, and honor your contracts for three years, mm. because we treat you decently. Recently. We treat you with empathy, with respect. Sometimes the guys call me and they say, um, I'm a little bit late today. Sometimes, sometimes they are in an event an hour away and I will dispense a camera person because I know like, mm. as long as questions can be asked and he can answer, we could literally edit it, edit it in a way that yeah. he's answering the questions. We're not asking them. We can write the questions maybe on screen mm. and he's answering and it's a 10 minute video. Mm. And we've done that for so we've done that for Junior, you know, because we work together with empathy. Yeah. I'm so sorry for, no, no, no. for uh, making messing up with your train of thought no not at all not at all please please um it's interesting to hear these things and what you i want to come back to like the youtube infrastructure yeah. and these different players that are that are now making a serious mark on digital media in south africa but now that you say that now you're taking me down another rabbit hole which yeah. is um having played for the pirates academy in huh. the 2000s right um why do model see children and children of important people always find themselves in these clubs. In these <laughs> clubs. You pay your way what? to Orlando Pirates Please, if you and saw, Kaiser Chiefs. If, if you saw me playing, if you saw me playing soccer in those days, you would not be saying that. It's not soccer; it's football. I'd have bro. embarrassed you, like. It is right not there. soccer; it is football. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first yeah. telltale sign. What? What were you? Left back, right? Striker. Back? Striker. Striker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, it is quite interesting, like this question of class and soccer, because I can't tell you the number of people, oh, Senzo Meiwa, by the way, was just one age group above me. So mm -hmm. sometimes we used to have practice against him and yeah, yeah um, obviously scored a lot of goals past him and uh, <laughs> but like the most talented, everyone knew like Senzo is going to become like the one from the academy. And he was already a goalkeeper by the time. I was a goalkeeper. Everyone knew like you can't touch Senzo, like he's going to the top, like in under it must have been a trip though because yeah. he breaks through mm. very late, mm. particularly mm. at Bafana Bafana level. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. Uh, in 2010, Kune breaks through Bafana Bafana mm. and he plays in the World Cup, mm. although in the second game he gets a red card. Kuna mm. becomes the face of the Bafana Uruguay Bafana. game. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the Uruguay yeah. game, he gets a red card and Munib Joseph scores in. Yeah, yeah. But Kuna predominantly, um, in, in fact, he, he, he makes that his number one jersey. Mm. Um, you know, and Senzo only breaks through around 2014 so that in the qualifiers for the 2015 African Cup of Nations under Sheikh Mashaba, mm. he is the main goalkeeper. But it, it must have taken him like six years mm. or four or five years to be Idomen and Kone's understudy. Mm. That must have been very difficult for him because if you're saying that you already, got, you guys were already, because we, in, in, at junior level football, we know who is the star amongst yeah. us. Yeah, exactly. So if he was already being given those messages and hearing that, mm. um, he knew he was going to be a star. Yeah. Even at Paris to break through, he didn't just break through with Kone. 
he was 19, 18 um, as a baby-faced kid and mm -hmm. he was already, uh, you know, Kaiser Chiefs' main goalkeeper yeah. at the time. Yeah. With Senzo, I think there was Francis Chancer. There were a lot of other goalkeepers before him, mm -hmm. before he broke through. So mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. No, it, it, was, it was fascinating. Um, I always remember, like, what I also remember of, of that time, though, is the number of brilliant, talented players who didn't quite make it, but for whom there was nowhere to go after that. Number one, the, the lack of money spent on actually giving people a, a comfortable place to live while they're playing soccer. Yeah. And so you actually got to see that in, in order for soccer to develop and grow, we needed to invest a lot more in just those academy years and making sure that players actually had like food on the table. Yeah. Um, and for every uh, Kune or Meiwa, um, there are people now languishing in poverty who went to those academies, who just like slipped through the cracks. Um, but also what happens to players even after their careers. Yeah. And like you say, you've been able to actually give players who after their careers people thought maybe were, were done a new avenue, a new way to get themselves on, on yeah. financial footing. So we, we, we don't actually know what happens to players, both from the academy side, who we might never see, and after their careers, you know, on either side of the limelight, how their lives can actually be... Yeah, I, I remember watching something that said in England, mm. only 5 to 10% of them make it. Mm. So... Um, Men United and all those big clubs have sophisticated academies. Man City, Liverpool, all of them. Brentford. Um, and these academies are sophisticated in so far as those kids go to school there. Mm. Um, some of them are housed and and and, and, and fed there. Yeah. I remember reading um, Andres Iniesta's um, autobiography. Um, he went to La Masia when he was 14. That's a boring autobiography, actually. <laughs> Very boring autobiography. Um, <laughs> Just soccer every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Today I played and even, yeah, yeah. even the, the language that it was written mm, in, mm. it was a very boring. Mm. I am Latin is one of the most fascinating. Okay. In yesterday's was just yesterday I passed to Javi, and <laughs> tomorrow yeah. I intend to pass to Javi. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Like it was so monotonous. Mm. But yeah, the monotony he explains there that when he was 13 and 12, he was crying, leaving his parents, mm. going to La Masia for Barcelona, mm. right? Uh, but that's that's the story of the person who made it. Yeah. Um, the story then you would hear on Sky Sports News when they do. Um, perhaps a deep dive on the topic is that only five to ten percent of them make it mm. in prof at professional level. Mm. Most of them are in League One, Championship, League Two, yeah. and then non-league football. Mm. Um, you know, many of the players, which means that they don't earn as much. Um, they only earn maybe five hundred pounds mm. uh, per week or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the people that they went to uh, to the academy with, some of them earn two hundred thousand pounds per mm. week, yeah. something like that. So it's very fascinating. And of course, the other side to it, which you're trying to mention, mm. which is the post-playing yeah. days. Yeah. Um, how many, realistically, how many people can we employ as Itisky TV who've mm. played football? We have Junior Kanye and Sovu Lagazi, and we've had Dugutuko Makanya for, I had Dugutuko Makanya for 14 months. Mm. He used to play for Orlando Paris, and then he gave me a phone call and said, Orlando Paris has given me a job as the Disky Challenge coach. Mm. So we lost him to the Disky Challenge, and I haven't replaced him. So we had Junior Kanye and Sovu Lagazi, and Dugutuko Makanya, and then Machaka as well. We had those four guys, which we've been using for the past junior for three years, mm. so for two and a half years, and the other guys for like the last 16 months, and then we lost one to Orlando Pirates now. But realistically, how many of the guys can we give those sure. jobs? And, and if we cannot absorb them, I see myself maybe having like five to ten former players if I'm trying to bloat my team up um, and create more content almost every day, right? Um, which is not going to happen because I have Ngulu Lego and culture. But let's say that I make enough money on Ngulu Lego and culture that I can then take this my salary from it, just keep split it in like maybe two or three and then have like uh, two or three other people that I can pay that to cre to create content almost every day. Mm. You know, maybe that's the only way that that could happen. But the point is that um, SuperSport can only uh, absorb so uh, so much of them, not more than ten. I think maybe most of the time they would have like six analysts. SABC can only absorb so many of them, and at any given time, there's like 800 uh, players that are currently playing now who, in five years, will be former players. You know, so there's a lot of players that play for these clubs yeah. and not all of them can be absorbed and of course the prerequisite is for them to be able to speak we must or, just we must just do a soccer episode one you day. are alienating yeah. your audience your 
audience wants to talk about the DA and the ANC and the EFF? You know what you realize at the end of the day with, with interviewing, and I'm sure you've seen this, is yeah. like, ultimately, you have to just go where you yourself are interested, and the audience will, you know will realize you're not trying to like manufacture direction or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm like, I'm fascinated at this intersection between sport and politics and sport and culture, <laughs> you know, that you, you have built. And you said something to me after our interview um, where you were like, if you look at what's happening on YouTube in South Africa right now, like this is the moment where people have been saying it's coming digital platforms are going to have as much power as the old platforms used yeah. to have, right? Um, and I got to thinking that 2024 might be the YouTube election. Like, these platforms, every, every party is going to be vying. When I was doing this in 2019, people, like, political parties were like, huh, YouTube? Like, what is that? Like, yeah. some, some people came, some You're people You're sort didn't. of like a pioneer of this, in wow. many ways, because not necessarily, not maybe inadvertently or by happenstance, it becomes that you are the pioneer of this because we were thinking we were talking about even the Saudi Mutsuneng. Yeah. Um, is it Mutsuneng or Mutsuneng? Mutsuneng, yeah. Mutsuneng, right? Um, interview, and I, I, I just remember that it was around the election mm. period that I would have heard you or seen you speak yeah, to yeah, him. Yeah, like um, the whole of the last, bef yeah, before like the 2019 election, we were just running around. Yeah. I think I think I'll claim that I think to something like serious political content yeah, serious political. yeah interviews on YouTube like if people go back into the archives they'll see this channel was one of the first yeah um, but what do you what do you make of this new explosion and and talk to us about how powerful this is actually becoming culturally before people even realize that you know what these channels are actually doing crazy numbers have crazy yeah. influence that maybe people aren't yet realizing yeah one of the things I've always been frustrated by is the fact that I was born in 1990. And because I was born in 1990, I missed a window of opportunity when the SAPC was hiring people mm. um, to be presenters, and um, they became, um, you know, brand names mm. as a result of that. Because think about it this way: that you have an opportunity to be exposed to millions of people yeah. at the time. So in the year 2000, I'm only 10 years old, and the SABC gets Kero Manana, Robert Marawa, mm. uh, Tsepo Mabona, Walter Mukwena to be the faces of their sports uh, products. Mm. You know, around the period. Now, at the time, black people don't really have access to DSTV, and that's the only outlet, or those are the only places that they can be able to see their sports and hear the sports on SABC radio stations. Mm. So you have a free hit for at least seven years. By around 2007, you start to see uh, checks with DSTV satellites mm. because PSL takes all of their rights and give them to Matu Choice for like mm. a billion, mm. right? So I wish I was part of that revolution, yeah. but then I just so happened to be part of another revolution. Mm. Um, even though it's not so much as a, as a free hit because we actually have to have our own equipment, sure. we have to start our own things. We have to gain our own respect from the ground up. It's not like we're given the platform. The SABC gives these people a platform. They have to be on SABC radio stations at the same time as they are on SABC 1, mm. 2, and 3, and sometimes ETV, right? And they have a free reign of 30, 40 million people watching them every day so that you become a Cohen Ferguson because you are a Carabo. You have a free reign where people mm. can only access two channels mm. for a 10-year period. And you become a superstar and mega yeah. and you are worth whatever you are worth based on that free reign that you have so we are kind of in that moment here that mm. there, there will be winners and there are winners and losers yeah. McG yeah. is a serious significant winner mm. although he doesn't see himself as a political um, you know mouthpiece mm. um, he interviews we interviews and yeah. some of his political interviews are critiqued mm. and criticized you of course are on, on the other side are the more political voice mm. in that you are in the space and people respect you you can ask them nuanced questions I try to be somewhere in the middle because mm -hmm. I'm actually very ignorant. I read, like I read a lot, mm -hmm. but I'm ignorant in a sense that I don't care. Like I, I actually could not care less. Some someone will say to me, speak to this person. I'm like, why? Yeah. You know, like and I couldn't care less. But talking about the moment in time that we find ourselves in, I talk about um losing a window of opportunity. I think that if you are born, if 
if you were born in the year 2005, it means you are how old? Mm. Um, 17 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. So it's too early for you to make any inroads within the space, mm. such that by the time you're 25 years old, mm. in the next seven years, or in the next eight years, there's like well-established YouTube channels yeah. that people prefer. They already are coming to your platform and say, I would rather watch podcast and show. Mm. Coming to my platform on the comment section and say, I would rather watch podcast and show. Mm. Imagine what will happen in eight years' time. They will say to those kids who are trying to make inroads on YouTube, mm. I would rather watch Legon Culture, SMWX, yep. um, Hustlers Corner, Illegal Podcast, mm. all of these podcasts that they like already that they've been watching for the past 10 years. But we are in the cusp of something very big here in that um, we spoke about the, um, um, John Stein Hazen yeah. as the, 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 the white president for yeah. Yeah. the 2024 elections. I spoke about him um, with Angela Mutama. We were chopping that. it up. Yeah. Um, and that leads to um, Mac G speaking to John Stinhazen mm. from that, from conversations started mm. around that. Um, and I think you would have had something to say about it. I think you wrote mm. about it on the Mail did, Guardian, yeah. Yeah, right? Did. So, like, video. there's a ripple effect yeah. such that, that that is now a lived mm. reality experience yeah. that is, we've imposed through those conversations, mm. we've imposed upon the DA a question of can we preempt whether or not this person is likable to black people? Mm. Let him, let's take him to Mac G. Mm. How does he perform there? He talks about roadkill, mm. ex-wife. I, I don't know. Like I've never watched Mac G. Mm. But I read about what happens mm. as a result of the interview. And I realize that, oh, okay, he's not received well. And then South Africa as well. We are now literally throwing the question back to South Africa mm. to say, how do you think about this white president? And we are providing the framework under which that could happen. We're not saying the DA is going to win the election. Yeah, sure. We say if the coalition is led by the DA with the most percentage between 25 and 30 percent, mm. then a leader likely will emerge from the DA. And who's the leader of the DA currently is Johnston Hazen. Mm. Or alternatively, who's the other leader? The spiritual leader is uh, Helen Zilla, mm. right? So you'll still have a white person as a president. Can you meditate yeah. on that question? Mm. You know, so the importance of these platforms is such that, that we are pushing the envelope. We are driving conversations forward. Rob Hersoff mm. is a man I mentioned so many times on my platform when I speak to, to Penuel, right? Mm. And his natural reaction to it is one of defensive. And I love Penuel. He's a, such a, an incredible gentleman. But sure. we, we disagree on certain points. He's like, okay. you want to talk about politics? And I'm like, yo, I heard Rob Herzog speak about ABCD on this channel. And for me, and I said this to you as well, if I've never heard a puppet master speak, I believe that after hearing Rob Herzog, I believe I've heard the puppet master. Mm. And then Rob Herzog goes to MACG, he goes to SABC, he goes to the panel show. It's like 100,000 on the panel show, 200,000 on, on, on SABC News, and then he does over 400 to 500,000 on MACG. Right? Is that pacifying of an image? What is he trying to do? Is he spreading out his image? So like, that's the power now of our platforms as YouTube channels. And instead of doing that on SABC or, or, or on or radio, ATV. it's actually being done all on these digital platforms. Absolutely, because it's visual. It's, it's yeah. more powerful. It's visual and it's yeah. timeless. You yeah. can consume it anytime you want. So the people that are interacting with that interview first mm. don't have an advantage over the people who will see it three days later, yeah. right? It's still the same words said by the same man yeah. dressing the same way, mm. right? So we can be able to repurpose it, we can send it to our friends, we can share these articles, mm. and you know, so that's the power of our platform. And the other thing I need to mention here, because I, I, I share this with you as well as we were speaking about this idea, when political parties, and this is for YouTubers now, mm. When political parties are campaigning um, for the national elections, they get funding um, mm. from whoever is funding them, right? And they have billions, sometimes hundreds of millions. They pay the SABC to go and spread their message. And the SABC will say, this message was proudly brought to you by the DA. Mm. And then um, they will play a DA ad or they will start a DA interview. Mm. And Sagina Kamwendo will let you know that this was sponsored by the DA so that you know if, he's not, if she's not pushing hard, you will know that that was paid for. In this. Sure. And we, we generally accept that during election period that we need to allow political parties to pay for those 
interviews. Now, we don't know how much they pay, but we can find out. It will happen um, in the lead up to the 2024 elections that you will be paid for those interviews. And it's an ethical thing between yourself and your team and your needs to, to, to ask yourself whether or not you want to accept that money. I've been thinking about it, and I'm saying if the SABC and ENCA, and I think even on YouTube I've seen um, the S from the DA, the EFF, uh, the EFF is going to strive for uh, economic freedom in our lifetime, like a 10 second can add or whatever, mm. like before I watch a video. So they paid for that. So now we are going to a period where they're going to have to pay us to do the interviews mm. with them in the lead up to the elections because they have business people that are funding them for their political campaign. They give us 50,000, we do an interview. They give us half a million, we do an interview. I don't know how to quantify that. But if it's guaranteed that 100,000 people will be watching them, then let's say a, a rent for every, hundred, uh, for every person who's watching. You know, two rand for every person who's watching. We could charge them like that. But then it means that when you're sitting with Julius Malema, you are not expected to do somersaulting questions. You are telling them this is sponsored by the EFF. It's a way for them to push their message. And you could ask Julius Malema on the side of Floyd Chivambo, on the side to say, this is for you and for your image, you paid for it. Would you like to, for me to spread in two or three questions that, that might be slightly difficult? And I'm not going to be overly emotional, overtly charged about it. I will just ask him, would you, um, why do you think you're going to get 20% um, whereas you only got 10% last time around? Just for my integrity and for my peace sake. Mm. But the audience will know that the EFF has paid for it. Now, this is where we're going, basically. But then we must know that this is three months lead up to the national elections. After that, we're not accepting money from these political parties. If that's what we're agreeing on, but there's no agree, there's no, there's no agreeing on this because it's each to each is or his own yeah. or her own. You decide for yourself what you want to do because they have the money, they pay the billboards. And Andele was, Andele was explaining to me that it's like a hundred thousand to rent per street or something like that. Mm. Like it runs into the hundreds of millions uh, for the billboards to be there um, throughout the election period. Yeah, so can spend they have the money, so they have yeah. to spend it on us too. Look, I think that's a, that's an interesting point, and there will be a lot of ethical questions about the extent to which these new digital platforms are able to be maybe co-opted yeah. by uh, political parties. They could even do it in, in very clever ways where, look, maybe some people, because this YouTube thing is like, you know, you've got to really invest your own time, resources. Someone comes with a lot of money and, and you start thinking, um, you know, smart political parties could say, actually, we don't even want you to say, you know, just make it look like, and then you can start to see how the political landscape can be manipulated by this new rise in digital media. I, yeah. I for one, um, I for one, I don't, I don't think I would, I would take, take it, but um, you have to take it. <laughs> I, get, I get it. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Like yeah, it's yeah. not an easy thing for me to say. Mm. It's just that in this moment, mm. I'm advocating for YouTubers. It costs mm. me two thousand every time I shoot. Yeah, yeah. It costs me two thousand rents for every time I shoot. Yeah. I'm advocating for my people on the digital space to say, let us normalize the idea that mm. only in that period they can't be giving the the, the SABC money and they can't give us. Mm. They can't be giving. What makes the SABC special and 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 and, and ATV special? and multi-choice special that hundreds of millions during the, the national election period, the campaigning, yeah. are spent on them. And then Tina, we're just interviewing them. I spoke to Nobundu Klazo Webster. She's the deputy leader of uh, BOSA, mm. uh, Musa Man's new party. Mm. Um, and I uploaded that recently, right? Yeah. I chopped yeah. it up with her and I, en I enjoyed it, right? And no money was charged. Um, I offered to Uber her for her return trip, right? Because I usually do that with, with my sure, guests sure. If, 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 if I think about it or they ask in advance, mm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I just offered to do that for yeah. her. That's the exchange. I have the audience. You have a message to spread. Spread your propaganda. I will ask you questions. We'll mm -hmm. make this interesting. But we know, it's not like a secret that during the election period, yeah. they don't pay money. They pay money to the SABC. They pay money to the ENCA mm -hmm. for the, for, for, and to, to YouTube for the specific purposes of promoting um, the, 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 their, their political party and their propaganda. I know it's an ethical dilemma to us, mm -hmm. but we, as long as we conscientize our people, our audience, that these people already pay. 
then we don't have a problem. We so, don't, yeah, I, I'm not yeah. saying that politicians must pay me, because I know like they're going to want a favor in return if mm. they pay me, mm. right? But in the period, mm. in the period that they are paying everyone, they can't be paying everyone other than us, no, look, including you. So where I, where I agree, right, is if they're running like a specific ad, so on TV, SABC, um, this message is sponsored by whatever, yeah. and they pay like that. That I can actually see. And there you know that there's a transparent, this is their ad, it's on my channel, but you know it's a separate ad on my channel. Yeah. Where I think there are problems is when they pay you to give them like an interview that they a, want. It's hour yeah. long Yeah, thing, like which is tailored seconds. for their, um, I would rather say, they're all going to want to be on our channels anyway, right? Yeah. Is rather say, look, I'm going to get the audience of a Julius Malema or a, a John Steenhazen yeah. or a Cyril Ramaphosa. If he he's ever... not going to do an interview. <laughs> he's not going to do an interview. I think he should come on. He on doesn't S do. He doesn't do. Interview. I think he should come on SMW. I think that's a good idea too, yeah. but he's not going to do yeah, it. Yeah. He doesn't answer to anyone. Ubaba came. That man doesn't answer to mm. anyone. Mm. Cyril Ramaphosa doesn't answer to anyone. <laughs> Well, he, do, he doesn't yeah, answer to anyone. Yeah. But just, just even, <laughs> even, even his press conferences, there's no Q&A opportunity. Yeah. He doesn't answer to anyone. He just reads pictures. <laughs> You're going to get me? Like, I, you know I could go on about, about okay. the president. And no, we're going to go back to that. You've even written songs about the former president, Jacob Zuma. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you an opportunity to say one line. I knew this. In I knew this interview was going to get me in serious trouble. Serious trouble. You've written um, songs about uh, Jacob Zuma. Mm. Say one line hey, about hey, hey. I'm I'm asking the questions here. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm <laughs> you, you had the chance to ask me this on yeah, 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 and culture, yeah. and then no, no. You are a doctor who doesn't have patience. <laughs> 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 on that on that note, though, like it's so funny to me how. You see, this goes back to the interview thing, right? Because... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so, so um, I want to say that those people paid for the interviews. I just don't have the evidence that they did. The overt stuff that we know, this message is probably mm. brought to you mm. by the PAC. That's fine. That's fine. We know that. Like, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. tells you that. Yeah. I want to say that they even pay for the interviews. Well, because, yeah. Because um, it's a pity that... That's why I said at the beginning, we can find out. Mm. We can find out mm. Mm. and we can have an industry standard for ourselves as podcasters. Well, yeah, I think then you'd have to say to you, because the thing is, my audience comes to me, and it may be different for a different audience, yeah. right? but my audience comes to me because they want me to ask the questions I have of those, of those people. Yeah, and they hold you accountable. Exactly. So the contract we have with them is you're going to ask the questions that you genuinely want to ask, not the questions that your guest wants you to ask. Right. And I think that is that is to some extent important where you're not saying to your audience you're pretending to do one thing, but on the other hand you're actually That's batting, why you're full disclosure is very important if we ever yeah. get to the point. Is that you do your own intro, spread the fire. <laughs> Are you encouraging arson? When you say people must spread the fire. You know actually you know when the when the um parliamentary building was 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 burned down. <laughs> So exactly. soon after that, I just yeah. I came on. <laughs> you are I just spread the fire. All yeah. the comments were like, "Yeah, don't say spread the fire." Yeah, you are encouraging <laughs> arsonists. I remember. Have you played yeah, yeah. Uh, pro evolution soccer? Yeah, yeah, but ages and ages ago. Okay, there's a song that says it takes one match to burn a thousand trees. It yeah. takes one tree to make a thousand matches, mm. but it takes one match to burn a thousand trees. Mm. Every time you say mm. spread the mm. fire, I think about the song <laughs> uh, as well. Yeah. What's yeah. your favorite um, FIFA game? Now now you're busy interviewing your, me again. We'll, we'll go back to the interview. <laughs> What's your favorite FIFA game? What, like which year? Yeah. You know what? I stopped playing FIFA in like... 2008 or so. Oh, that's late though. Yeah. So and you slightly older than me. Mm, so like, I, I don't really play PlayStation much anymore. But I, you know what? What I, the one I Which used to Which was have, your favorite World, FIFA edition? World Cup 2002. <laughs> <laughs> that was a classic. You know, you'd be able to cross the ball and then you'd score with a bicycle like every single time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. FIFA 04, 05, 06, 07, 09. Wow. The kids yeah. these days don't even know FIFA goes back that far. Yeah, I loved yeah. FIFA 07 because the free mm. kicks were easy to, to kick. Mm, 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 um, mm. With the Drop. I'm, I'm a Chelsea fan, so mm, mm. I could take a free kick from outside the box and score. You said you beat AKA, and that's unverified. Actually, World Cup 2002 was where I beat AKA. Yeah. Many, many times. We 
would go back it's to my house. It's an untested before. allegation. Well, look, I mean, he can come out and deny it if he wants to, but uh, we all know what happened. Fair no, he, was, he was actually pretty good. Super at, mega baby. He was actually good at FIFA. Yeah. Um, he was better than me at FIFA, but I was better than him at soccer. So. In real soccer. Yeah, like which one do you want? Do you want it to be the video game thing or the? <laughs> That's another untested allegation. But anyways, we can continue. You, Thank you. For why are you doubting my footballing ability? So my knee won't allow me to demonstrate these days, but everyone knows that that I could that I could jam. He will be right back, but he was a right back. <laughs> uh, AKA, I saw him in the I'm a piano uh, mm. exhibition match. He was a very mm, tall right mm, back. Mm, 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 he played in the same game. As Casper Nyovest, is it? Who scored a goal courtesy Was of Casper an assist? Casper decent. Well, Junior Kanye dribbled a couple of people and he gave him an assist. Yeah. And Casper, boom, goal. Decent, decent. So we shall see them yeah. in the boxing yeah. ring one day. Okay. Can I can I interview you now? Yeah, that's a beauty of. Can content. we talk? No, can we talk? Because we don't work for SABC. And, and actually, in some ways, we're not limited. That's so true. And in yeah. some ways, we actually don't do interviews. We do more conversations. Yeah, right? yeah. Which is which is. Cool. I like you though. Like I, I enjoyed uh, having a conversation. No, with you. it was cool. I, yeah. I'm actually quite surprised at the numbers that our, our interview did because it was quite serious. Yeah. And it's done nearly 50,000 views already. Yeah. So. Maybe there's something about you and I that mm. we are young kids in South Africa, 33 and 32 years old, mm. um, and we look different and we have similar interests in that we come from hip hop, mm. me as a fan, you as a musician, mm. right? I used to follow your rap group, NTT, and um, somehow we've, and you're a scholar and I'm not, and somehow we've been able to even create content mm. and exist in a space where we amass a following, mm. right? Mm. And we could have a conversation, a decent, pleasant exchange between yeah. you and I, and we come from different places even in class. Yeah. You know, I come from Inyanga, like um, the most dangerous place in South Africa, mm. right? In Kukuina Majajambian, in shacks, you know, and you come from where you come from, right? And um, we can be able to sit at a table and speak decent English mm. to an audience mm. that they can understand, and we both toss us slash slubies, mm. right? So I think that w there was an appeal to that conversation mm. where it's it's South African. Mm. That conversation is South African. You could have been Tswana or Tsonga or Pedi, right? But it just so happens that we're both clubies mm. and we're both tossers, we're both speaking English, and we come from completely different places, mm. and we're respectful as well of each other, you know? Um, and I enjoyed it. Like, I, was, I, I thought I was dreaming when I was doing it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, oh, really? this is actually surreal. Mm. Uh, in the same way that when I was doing um, the Advocate Defo interview, mm. like, it felt surreal. And every other interview as well, because actually, it's over, like, as is my childhood. Ardo, even yeah. though I, I never followed Orlando Paris, like mm. it was my club, I can't confirm my club, but um, I used to watch so, and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm interviewing you now. Yeah. But yeah. by the time I got to, 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 to interview him, yeah, and he works for us, I had been interviewing so many players who I was like, oh, I used to watch you play mm. football, mm. type of mm. thing, you know. So, a lot of these things are like a dream come true for me. D tell, tell us a bit more about your personal journey from you know, Nyanga to actually journalism and yeah. YouTube because I mean you say we come from different classes now you've overtaken me like, no, with no. Disky TV <laughs> I, I, see, <laughs> I see the numbers you're doing I don't even try right. you we, drive we're car. not in the same class you like, drive a car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, trying to get the, well let me I'm, say this I'm a humble academic like no no no, no. But you choose to be because <laughs> you, you I, I asked you yeah are you gonna go back to 702 yeah, and yeah, make yeah. that bread? <laughs> Mail and Guardian? Yeah, well, so you, you, I mean, you're making bread, bro. Hey, you man. know, um, but yeah, like, yeah, tell, tell sure. us, cause, like, because I think it's, it's a fascinating journey, South African journey that's right on the cusp of someone born in Yanga and then you, you, you come into journalism and now you've built this kind of YouTube empire. Um, how, how did you make that happen? Um, one of the worst things you can do in this world, because I'm not religious as well, the, one of the, so that means I believe that when I'm dead, I'm dead, and I'm not waking up um, into a different reality, um, into a different um, corridor uh, on this in this universe, in one way or the other. The worst thing you can do for yourself, if you believe that you are dying, sorry, you're gonna die once, and that's it, is is, is to give up on yourself. So. Um, having come from where I come from, 
Um, my mother changed a lot of uh, my stepfathers. I have two sisters. Mm -hmm. um, my mother didn't grow up with her mother, right? So for me, I've always been aware that this is not it. Like. Mm -hmm. Her, I almost saw her being killed when I was eight years old. Hmm. She lost her teeth. She had teeth just like me, right? Hmm. And then when, when she, when I was eight in 1998, that's the year of the World Cup. It was my first World Cup that I watched mm. a lot of the matches in Shibians, right? Her boyfriend was hitting her for whatever reason. They were always fighting every, every, every weekend. Mm. And when I saw her being beat almost to death, and I saw her two weeks later without teeth. She almost looked like a new person. Hmm. And my grandmother had six children and she never raised a single of them, right? Um, and that's why my mother didn't know what family looks like, what, um, what even being treated decently by a man looks like because she never grew up with her father hmm. and her mother was dumping her, them all over the place with families in Cape Town. Um, you know, so for me, I all, when I was that age, I knew that Something ain't right, and I, even when she was almost killed, I pick up, the, I picked up a rock, try to throw it, but that's an eight-year-old mm. throw mm. to a grown man who was probably in my, my age, mm. um, 32 or 35, whatever it is, right? So, when, throughout my childhood, the KGC in Yanga, um, meeting up gang violence, seeing violence visited upon women, uh, but we were more violent towards each other because um, every year in South Africa there are 18,000 to 20,000 murders. Significantly, 18,000, if there are 20,000, will be black men against other black men. We kill each other more. Mm. Um, we are more brutal towards each other. Um, whatever feminists would like you to believe, we are more vicious towards each other. Whatever farmers would like you to believe, there are more murders amongst ourselves black men to other black men because there exists a permanent danger in our interactions. I know that Sizwe, you are capable of stabbing me although I trust you, although you trust me, you know that if there's a physical altercation I could strangle you or you could strangle me if you have the training um, and you could kill me right? So there exists a level of danger amongst our interactions exacerbate that with alcohol and drugs um, it becomes something else. I once took my uncle to Enyanga Day Hospital, local Day Hospital which is close to Enyanga. Um, we were looking for assistance at 5 p.m. on a Saturday. We went home in the morning at 3 a.m. without having assistance because he had been stabbed multiple times in his body, right? And um, he had complications. He had to pee through a tube, right? Um, so he had complications with that tube and he was feeling pain. Mm. But when we got there, there was a green, red, orange list. So it's not like he was shot and he was dying. So the people that they had to prioritize were people who were dying. Mm. Right, so we saw people were stabbed here. I would never forget that. Like People were stabbed here. People were shot in their bodies. Mm. So in the morning, I think there was a placebo effect from the trauma that he told me, I'm okay, let's go, mm. at 3 a.m., right? Um, and this is the weekend. And this happens every weekend. It's a factory that produces dead bodies every weekend mm. because of the combination of alcohol and drugs and violence. A violence through um, the frustration of uh, growing up in the township and the small-mindedness of the things that we, we fight over. You know, So I always felt, as I come from that place, that I'm not supposed to be here. Like It, it just became a permanent thing in my head that mm. I'm not supposed to be here. Um, thankfully, I had a high work ethic. I didn't drink alcohol. I didn't do drugs. I did them. Like I dabbled on them when I was a teenager, but that was not significant mm. to even tell stories about, right? But by the time I was 21, 22, I was already coaching a football club. Um, and this is my, like, literally my introduction to football media. Mm. I was already coaching. I had uh, my CAF DNC license, coaching a football club locally. I was a secretary of my football association mm. in Yanga. And then I do community radio, and then two minutes, two minutes, I do Sokala Duma. But I was working at a call center throughout this period, so I'm literally hustling these jobs in mainstream media. So community radio station, I do a demo, and I send it to Jason Aka, who's now my partner. Um, he listens to it when I was at the community radio station. He's looking hmm. for a voice for Sokala Duma radio. And he's like, yeah, this is the voice. And one December in 2016, he calls me. In 2017, we start working together at Sokala Duma radio. Hmm. Two years later, in 2019, we come to Joburg together. Um, and we innovate it is TV, basically. Like, mm. like that's the, the shortest way I can tell you that story. Yeah. But I think, like, 
because I believe that I only die once, I, I don't want to live in that misery of mm. uh, when I was a kid. I was helpless when I was a kid. Um, it's something that happens to you. Like you don't choose it, you don't choose your parents, you don't mm. choose who your mother is. It was imposed on me by circumstances, but every single moment that I had a power to overturn it, I did it. Like, yo, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot live here. Mm. I cannot live like this. I cannot drink. I, I can't even, I, I can't go to my township now. Mm. Like genuinely, I can't go to my township now. Mm. Um, even though the sentiment, um, logic trumps that sentiment to say, look, don't go there because people can see you now on television and stuff that you're doing. Mm. Um, you might get robbed. Like, you know, and I grew up with those people that could rob me and they could shoot me and they could kill me. You know, so I worked like I, I worked really difficult, um, high work ethic. I remember in my twenties, I never I never went to a single party, mm. single party, because I decided I'm not going to drink. I'm going to be disciplined. I was I was not born to parents who could provide me a life that I want. So mm. I'm going to have to create it for myself. It's always fascinating to understand the behind the scenes of how someone, you know, someone might see Disky TV now and be like, oh, wow, like yeah. that, 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 that was easy or, but, but the, the journey and the, and the struggle and the, the trauma that, yeah. that comes with, with living in this country, but also in, in a place within this country, which even makes other places in the country look safe. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, um, is, is amazing. And, you know, shout out to you for, for doing that and, and, you know, for what you've built. Thank you. Uh, I think it's it's important. Why uh, do you speak like this? Like what? It's like you're massaging an audience when you speak. Why don't you offend people? It's very important to offend people. Offense is very important. I think if you are really free, you have to understand and accept that some people will offend you. Mm. I think we'll try. we try to design a world where offense does not exist and then we become tyrants and that's what's happening on twitter that if you say anything mm. that is somewhat offensive you could be blocked uh, and there is a term now that says permanently suspended which i think is very farcical mm. why are you permanently suspended just ban them so, if, if that's what you want to do even though yeah. i don't agree with that i think that's in some ways just my personality type like I'm not necessarily an overly confrontational person. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also I get quite tired of a media landscape where offense is the currency that you use to, to get, you know, to get your clicks or to, yeah. or to, you create a controversial persona. You don't even believe the offensive things you're saying, but you know that they're going to create traction. Right. And I just, when I watch stuff like that, I'm just like, I feel uncomfortable. I know not everyone does. Just say you are incapable, because I'm trying to yeah, imagine yeah. you being offensive, and I can't. Yeah, well. Maybe the people that work here know you <laughs> as offensive. Is he offensive? Like, doesn't he ever get ag aggravated? Nah. <laughs> like, the closer in him coming out. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't he say something like that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're ending this. It was thing my now. intention to make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I didn't at least even, for a second. You know, and did I ask your 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 crew and your directors and all of that about That was you? your prerogative. That was culture. up to you to do that. Wow. Because wow. you were not not allowed to do it. <laughs> you were not, no, not no. allowed can, to do Can it. you invite me? Can I come like tomorrow? Uh, you, I actually you, have some things I need to say. You, <laughs> you are family, bro. No, no. Like, for you sure. make me feel for so sure. comfortable. I really I appreciate enjoyed that, my conversation with you. Yeah, no, it was it was dope but it was a do we have classic. time or you are wrapping classic. up do we have time so or? you know i have like a thousand things i still want to ask you okay. but i want i want to ask you one more thing okay um because you've you've told us about uh your your own personal story and that story is linked to a broader political story in the country about how we had a great deal of hope for what would happen and how things have broken down all across the country. Um, your story is amazing because it's an exception. You were somehow able to navigate your way around. Yeah. And, um, but just as we I, I fought with someone um, maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. They were telling me that what, what happened to me is possible. And mm. I kept on convincing them it's that not. it's an exception. It's not. It's I not. fought with them like we're playing 
fives football. Mm. His name is Theo Kwapman. Shout out to Theo. Mm. Um, we were just fighting like verbal words. Mm. Like we were not fighting as like aggressively, but yeah. it was actually tense. He's telling me that someone like me can emerge from the township, not drinking, not doing drugs, yeah. not hitting women and stuff like that. And I'm saying to them, it's an exception. This is not a place for people to live. You pass through the eye of the eye of a needle, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I ha I'm violent. Like I, I don't practice it. I mm. control it, mm. right? I think about guns and the violence that I saw there, mm. and mm. I have the potential or propensity to be violent. Mm. You know, so you don't actually pass through it because mm. it's still with you. Even in my language, I'm rude sometimes. Mm. Not rude to people. I am decent to people, but True. I use rude language sometimes mm. because I was trained from that environment. So mm. you don't really um, get away from this scot free. No, and it's an important insight into the way that the society, you know, plays on one's mind. Yeah. You know, um, is is the ANC the answer? <laughs> because when you, <laughs> because when you, I ask you guys the question. <laughs> because, <laughs> because when you invite them onto your channel and you're talking nicely to Cyril Ramaphosa and he's paying you a million rand, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to play this. Clip. At least you can but, have but that. But honestly, not maybe not as the ANC. But what's your take on the current political situation, right? Because yeah. we say we have influence, and what do we do with that influence, right? Do do we just um, play it safe, or you do we actually say it how it anything. is? And, and you could have asked me anything. You, you brought up the president in the first place. You could have asked me anything. You're killing my political career. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, anyways, yeah, I like, think that's a very good question. Mm, um, mm. I think it's pretty, it's pretty clear that the African National Congress is not the answer. Um, I appreciated my conversation with you in that you were very straightforward. I think you had thought about it, mm. perhaps because you engage uh, political content a lot, mm. uh, and you speak to people in the political space a lot, mm. um, that you had already formulated your thoughts about it. Um, we can underestimate how many times we as interviewers speak to people, and we could be passive in that because the question is not posed on us, yeah. but thrown back at us, we don't think about and medit meditate on these things. But I think... It's pretty clear that there haven't been an answer for a very long time. Mm. If you listen to uh, Professor Sam Peter Blanche, when he, when he mm. tells, in 2013 he tells a story and Nelson Mandela is so dying. Let me stop you there. You're like, sure. I'm not a scholar. But Professor Sam Peter Blanche, <laughs> on page 32 of his... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to minimize... When I say I'm not a scholar and I'm mm. ignorant, I'm trying to tell people that I don't read to the extent that they could mm. be reading or they are reading mm. so that they think that they want to compete with me with knowledge. Mm. I'm giving the audience the opportunity to say, you know better than me, so they don't have to comment and say sure. what I said was wrong. Mm. I'm not a political commentator. Mm. I'm, I'm well read, right? But I'm not, I, I, I don't, sometimes I read and I forget things, mm. right? So Professor Sambi Taylor Branch says in 2013 when Mandela was about to pass on, mm. uh, months before he passes on, he tells a story of how um, the Westerners and the Americans and the CIA intercepted the Cordesa conversations and how, um, <laughs> like a thief in the night, the Americans came and persuaded the ANC to do away with their socialism ideas such that documents were changed overnight. Conference policy documents were changed overnight uh, to switch them from socialism, uh, socialist documents, and, 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 and change the ANC from having a socialistic or socialist outlook um, to have a more capitalistic outlook. And he mentions the word trickle, uh, trickle down economy, uh, that when the rich get rich, they will employ the poor such that, that when they make money, then the poor will make money through being employed by the rich, uh, which is very farcical. But uh, Professor Sambi Terabanj talks about that because that's what uh, people like Tabombeki were preaching um, eventually. So he talks about the ANC being intercepted as a political party um, in there. And then I speak to um, Karl Niehaus, who confirms that this happens because he was the deputy to Sir Ramaphosa at the 
a, a deputy chief negotiator for a, or, or whatever. Mm. Uh, maybe for, I forgot the term that he used, but it was in and around those negotiations. It's there in your interview where he goes into it and all of that. Yeah, ab absolutely. And it, it says that... Uh, I think it was deputy spokesperson or something. Yeah, yeah. But it was around mm. um, what was happening uh, during the Codessa talks. And it talks about um, specifically Cyril Maposa driving one, one model of a car um, going into the negotiations and six weeks later he drives a completely different model which he could not have afforded um, in that short period of time um, which is obviously implication that perhaps he, he must have been bought in order for him um, to to go along with whatever was negotiated as the eventual constitution um, of the country so from that uh, if you observe whatever happened there of course people will have counter stories but of course if you take it on face value and because uh, Professor Sambiter Blanche was respected by the Afrikaners. I think the Nationalist Party was using him as, a, as their main um, economic advisor. He was there in those negotiations and he was furious, but for a different reason. He was furious because there was going to be American influence uh, within the South African landscape. And of course, the Afrikaners are strongly against uh, American influence um, and their triumphalism and, and capitalism. I don't know whether they wanted Dutch influence. I don't know, like, because he didn't expand further on it. Uh, sometimes we can assume that people are furious for the same reasons we are furious, just like we think Rob Hershoff is angry at Ramaphosa for the same reason that we are angry at mm -hmm. Ramaphosa. Gandhi. It's for completely different reasons that he's angry. Just because he's saying Ramaphosa is not working um, and is slow um, and is not a good president is not for the same reason that we are saying. So we, it can't be that a, a billionaire will have the same grievances as us. He can always buy himself a generator um, or his own power power supply you know he can always get himself uh, solve himself his own problems but anyways like going back to the question about the ANC and whether or not they are an answer I don't have the answer to that uh, but I know that if I give that context to the beginning of how yeah. they started their tenure in power, you can understand why they are where they are. And I think I've, I've said this to people that it looks like we are looking at a bunch of people who are stealing for the last time. Mm -hmm. Like it's just the final period. And I, when we had the interview, we were talking about the idea of whoever is the president of the African National Congress, as they are squabbling, right, to be the president of the African National Congress in December, might be the last president. Um, or might be the first president to preside over an African National Congress, uh, Congress which is not in power, right? And then the other thing I want to say to answer that question is, it's not obvious to me that coalitions will be the answer as a result of us being frustrated by the ANC. Mm. Let's look at the coalition parties all over where they've expressed themselves, and we need to be very careful to think about whether or not they are playing. They are not playing squarely in the hands of the people who we think are our oppressors. Mm. When. Rob Herzog is um, agitating for coalition parties and is pushing this idea of a person, is pushing that idea of a party. We need to question it. You know, Gwede Matashi says a lot of things and sometimes is very condescending mm -hmm. when he speaks. But one time he said, when your idea coincides with the idea of, a, of the enemy, or when your answer coincides with the idea of the enemy, you have to rethink it. Go back. Go Mm. Why is it that your answer coincides with the answer of the enemy? Mm. Billionaires are not our friends. Um, they don't do things from the kindness of their hearts. There is a reason why Bill Gates paid or spent 300 million um, in the 10-year period between 2000 and 2010. Um, you know, because before that he was being demonized in media. Um, people were throwing him with a pie. Uh, they were hating on him uh, because there was this uh, idea that he deliberately created uh, computer viruses so that he can provide you with an antivirus, right? And then he spends, between 2000 and 2010, he spends 300 million um, in, in, in companies, um, in, TV, in TV channels, in advertising, advertising revenue, and then they pacify his image. And guess what? Post-COVID, he becomes the villain he was trying to run away from. Because we asked the question about, okay, there's COVID. Where are you a doctor? 
Like, yeah, but, and then, of course, um, you see the things that he's doing, um, the rise in stock prices of um, COVID medication and so on and pharmaceutical companies, mm. and you're like, oh, okay, this guy always think, has a plan. I, I think you're watching too many conspiracy documents. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> but the answer is not the answer. <laughs> um, maybe I should have just said that. Yeah, well, but yeah, there's yeah. no easy answer. Yeah. No, no, for sure, for sure. Bro, listen, um, thousands of things more I'd like to quiz you on. But um, thank you very much for coming through. Thank you for the platform you've built. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for coming on the channel. Um, How long did we, do you think we spoke? I have no idea, actually. How long uh, did we speak? One hour twenty. One hour twenty minutes. You were the one who advised me to make my interviews longer. So comment yes. down below if you think if you think the interviews should be this long. They shouldn't if, be thirty minutes. If not, then then comment on Gulego's channel and tell him that he should. I don't read comments. <laughs> Thank so guys, you for inviting me. Thanks so much for coming out. Do you want to give us a, an ayaya or a spread the fire? <laughs> <laughs> I do not condone the usage of match sticks. <laughs> Uh, I do not condone arson. Man, bolela ka kolo kwenye dota ya sema shobi ni uya bolela umashia umfugange uanga peka ba ukaya lenga pa ya stick spray shobi lisle elizba kala se kauteni. It feels like an out of body experience. Engoska kolo mda kweto. Yo, you twisted your tongue when I made you speak closer. <laughs> And you're <laughs> you chose you chose to speak closer. You chose to speak. You were your literally closer. like speak closer now, and I was like, no, I was like, yo, <laughs> <laughs> your brother's here. Does your brother speak Sutu? Or what? You also closer. Yeah. Oh, nice one. Your father's darling. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Can you close in closer? Come, come, no. sit <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm sketchy closer as well. No, uh, no, but come. no it's not sketchy. Um, it's, it's a moment in time. Come through. It's a moment in time. You see, that's the beauty of creating content. We're not on SABC One. <laughs> There's no broadcast complaints this is, commission. It's going to be bonus content. <laughs> uh, as, as, as long as it's in the video. You say, Here's your camera, right? Bully say, I'm going to 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 say, yeah, no. Ni subscribe, ni comment, ni like. Thank you.